I welcome you all to AIOC 2021. I'm your host, uh, Zupi, and we are reporting live from Hall Stallard. Yeah. Uh, we are right about time. It's in about one minute, we'll introduce our first speaker. Let me call out the names of, we have our chairperson, Dr. Mahipal S. Sachdev. We have Dr. Kulapali N. Rao, another, another chairperson. We have Dr. Nam Peru, Perumal Sami, uh, chairperson. Our co-chairpersons, Dr. S. S. Badrinath, Dr. S. Natrajan, Dr. Lalit Verma, Dr. Namrata Sharma, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy, Dr. Santosh Ji Hunavar, and Dr. Arup Chakrabarti. Uh, the session will be moderated by Dr. Partha Biswas. I'd also like to welcome our panelists, Dr. Krishna Prasad Kudlu, Dr. Amit Porwal, Dr. Parikshit Gokate, Dr. Fairuz, and Dr. Murthy, along with Dr. Jatendra. Dr. Sonu Goel is also here as one of our panelists. I welcome you all. Good morning, Dr. Nachar, Madam. Good morning. How are you doing, Madam? Good morning. Good Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 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 Good Hello, everybody. Hello. Yes. All right. <laughs> Good morning to everyone. Good this is Dr. Nath. Dr. Nath, sir, how morning. are you, sir? Nice to see you. Good Gopal. morning. Good morning, Gopal. Good morning. Uh, Martha, can we start? Uh, shall I, right. uh, shall yes, I start? Sir. It is 9.31. And uh, let me uh, start. And uh, we can, uh, first and foremost, uh, a very, very warm welcome to our chairpersons, Dr. Gulapalli Rao, sir, Dr. Nam Paramal Swami, sir, and Dr. Badrasa is not able to be present, Dr. Mahipal, sir. Our co chairpersons, uh, uh, Natrajan, sir, Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, Dr. Namrata, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Chitra, Dr. Santosh, and Dr. Arup Chakravarti. Our panelists are Dr. Amit Porwal, Dr. Fairuz, Dr. Jatinder Singh Balla, Dr. Krishna Prashad Kudlu, Dr. Parishit Gokte. Dr. Som Shila and Dr. Sonu Goel. This is a very, very important session. It is one of our most important sessions where we are here, the endowment lectures series. And this has been started by Dr. Lalit Verma last year. And we are taking it forward and we have a full session for this. The session, how we will design and how we will conduct, I will just tell you in 30 seconds. So the first introduction of Dr. Daljit Singh endowment lecture will be by Professor Maipal Sasdev. Professor Maipal Sasdev will in short tell about Dr. Daljit Singh and then he will introduce Dr. Nachir. Nachir Madam will then give her oration on the endowment lecture followed by the Gulapali Rao Endowment Lecture. Dr. Namrata Sharma will introduce Dr. Gulapali Rao. And Dr. Gulapali Rao, sir, will introduce Dr. B.K. Jain. Dr. B.K. Jain, sir, will give his endowment lecture. L.P. Agarwal, sir, to be introduced by Dr. Lalit Verma. Dr. Lalit Verma will also introduce Dr. Uh, and Dr. Ladit Verma or Dr. Mehpal sir, who has uh, another commitment, will introduce Dr. T.S. Surendran. And Dr. T.S. Surendran sir will give his endowment lecture. I have the privilege of introducing Nam Perumal sir, Swami sir. And Nam Perumal Swami sir will introduce Dr. Mangar Dogra. And then the lecture will be there by Dr. Mangar Dogra. Dr. Badrinath, sir, will be introduced by Dr. Natrajan. And Dr. Arup Chakravarti will introduce Dr. Tara Prashad Das, who will give the endowment lecture. Similarly, Dr. Santosh Hunavar will introduce Dr. Gopal Lingam, sir. And then Dr. Gopal Lingam, sir, will give the 2020 endowment lecture for SS Badrinath. If we can now start the proceedings, I request my pulser 
to start the proceedings. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Partha, and uh, welcome all of you to this uh, very important scientific session on the endowment lectures. Uh, I would say that this is given to the best of the best within ophthalmology. Uh, this, these awards or these lectures are conferred on them uh, for their dedication towards ophthalmology and their ex extraordinary work that they have done in the field of ophthalmology. And these are named lectures based on the names of individuals who have done yeoman surface in ophthalmology. So it is my proud privilege to first say a few words about Dr. Daljeet Singh in whose name uh, we have put this first endowment lecture that is Dr. Daljeet Singh endowment lecture. Uh, as we all know, Dr. Daljeet Singh was, I would say the father of IUL surgery in India. And he was known to be a prolific surgeon, a great academician and a great thinker. Uh, he's, uh, he did his medical school as also his post-graduation and rose to become a faculty member at the Amritsar Medical College. From there on, uh, personally, I asked him, I said, uh, why did you come into practice? He said, one day I was sitting in the chair and I was sitting in my chair and I thought that I was going to die. So I just put in my papers and said, I will start my own. So that is the, uh, and he was not at all prepared. And he said that the board was put for his practice. And uh, there was a kind of a hurricane that came and uh, the entire board also ripped apart, but still. I have to translate in English. Yeah, so I for, uh, for South Indians. What, like what, he, what he said was that uh, he will just be swinging on his chair in his assistant professor's room. And that is how the life will pass. So if he wants to do something, he has to kind of uh, leave this job and start something on his own. And that's what he said. It was a decision taken within hours and nobody was uh, knowing. And at home, he said, I put in my resignation papers when he came and he said, I put in my resignation papers. And he was very, very ill prepared for his practice. He just, uh, uh, and the day the board was put, there was a storm or a hurricane and uh, the board also got ripped apart. So that is how it is. And uh, Dr. Daljeet Singh has uh, to his name the iris claw lens, which is there, uh, plasma knife. He has worked and uh, later on, I think uh, the social service that he wanted to do, uh, he did step out and uh, fight the election for the member of parliament uh, from Amritsar against uh, Captain Amrinder Singh which uh, and Arun Jaitley, which unfortunately he could not win, but he managed to get close to a lack of votes. Uh, Dr. Daljeet Singh has been the past president of All India Ophthalmological Society and also the founding president of the Intraocular Implant and Refractive Society of India. He has several publications, several orations and several presentations to his name. So that is Dr. Professor Daljeet Singh on whose name this oration is, uh, uh, is, is being done. And we have none other than Professor Dr. Nachiar uh, whom we all love, recognize, and we know for her great expertise in the field of ophthalmology, especially cataract surgery. She will be delivering this lecture. She did her MBBS, DO and MS, uh, MBBS and DO from Madras uh, University and then from Madurai, her uh, MS. She was a surgeon from 65 to 71 at the Erskine Hospital, Madurai. 72 to 73, uh, she did uh, for pathology at the University of Illinois, Chicago, under the guidance of Dr. David Apple. So we all know that David Apple has great work in ocular pathology. And from there on, she went on to uh, uh, become a professor of neuro-ophthalmology at uh, the Erskine Hospital, Madurai, 77-78 pathology and neuro-ophthalmology. She was at Harvard University, Boston. And uh, then she became medical officer at Arvind Eye Hospital starting 1979, then became professor uh, uh, at Abraham Lincoln School of Medicine uh, in Chicago. Uh, again, uh, professor of ophthalmology at Madurai. Uh, uh, then she went on to uh, become the joint director at Arvind Eye Hospital, director of human resource development at Arvind Eye Hospital, and the vice chairman of Arvind Eye Hospital at Madurai. Uh, she has since 2011 left uh, active practice of ophthalmology and is 
a farmer uh, going back to nature and uh, it's a treat to watch the organic farming they are doing uh, at the oro farm which belongs to the oro lab uh, she's been uh, a very uh, played a very pivotal role in the establishment and the development of arvind i care a uh, system which is one of the most talked about systems whether it be in india or abroad it has been talked about in magazines like time etc books uh, fortune at the bottom of the pyramid by prahlad the uh, business chapters uh, uh, in harvard school what not i i personally am uh, overawed when i met dr nachiar maybe uh, a couple of years ago also as also in uh, arvind and the amount of work and the discipline and the sadgi as they call in uh, uh, hindi is uh, that means that uh, they are down to earth uh, uh, grounded to earth i would say a uh, personality a towering personality that she has uh, it is my proud privilege to ask ma'am nachiar to please uh, give her endowment lecture and we are really honored to have you give the same thank you thank you sir good morning everyone it is with great pleasure that i am here to deliver the prestigious daljit singh lecture 2021 i would like to thank the scientific committee of aaos for honoring me by giving this great opportunity to give this oration the topic is changing trends in ophthalmology because to talk anything in ophthalmology i am totally outdated and to talk about farming i'm sure the audience will not be interested so i thought i selected a common subject to share my experience regarding dr daljit singh he was a contemporary the same years of practice of ophthalmology he served as a member of faculty at the government medical college all these years he brought the lens implant history to india in late 70s and performed large volume cataract surgery especially with his iris claw lens with excellent results in the eye cam he was a great teacher and a great innovator and his award padma shri award he has received the most uh, prestigious awards and dr b c rai award in those days i mean even now the ophthalmologist admire him as a great hero now before starting uh, my real topic i would like to share my journey from 68 to 76 i was in the government service as a medical officer and i was very lucky to have dr venkat sami my elder brother who was the head of the department from 76 to 2010 my journey was completely in aravindai hospital I spent 34 years as a full-time ophthalmologist, as a surgeon, as a teacher, as a trainer. I I think uh, you must all remembering that uh, in late early 90s we had sight savers IOL microsurgery program, and I was involved almost for 10 to 12 years. About 2,000 ophthalmologists from India and other countries were trained, and I really enjoyed my position as a director of human resource. as an administrator and as a director and i retired from a clinical service in 2010 the reason for retirement were very simple my knowledge was not updated in ophthalmology number 2 my surgical skills were not up to the quality work and three my reflexes were becoming slow so i decided that i should quit my clinical work in and take care of the administrative and other work in arvind eye care system my journey from 2010 to 2021 as a farmer i come from a farmer's family and have gone into farmer's family so i'm spending most of my time in farming learning new techniques appreciating what our forefathers did i always think we were not born as ophthalmologist we need not cling on to ophthalmology forever whatever you do enjoy it now coming to the topic it's very close to my heart ophthalmology has undergone radical changes in india than any other specialty especially from 70 to 2000 so our batch like our age group people born between 1940 and 
1935 to 1945, we had seen all the transformations right from uh, the type of patients to the investigation equipments. Now, ophthalmology has undergone a radical changes in India than any other specialty. Why? I could make out four main reasons. One reason, IO surgery came into practice in the 1980s. Technology and equipment were improved, giving the best visual outcome to the patients. So this created a big awareness in the ophthalmic patients in the community. Number two reason, second reason was the able leaders in the government sector who were keen in developing ophthalmology throughout India. In various states, we had excellent leaders and they brought, they raised the standard of ophthalmology. And number third reason I could make out was a large nonprofit organization for eye care services started like Aravindai Hospital Madurai, LV Prasad in Hyderabad and Shankar Netran Chennai in late 70s and early 80s. And similar centers, nonprofit organization were also started in various states subsequently. And these centers started offering postgraduate training fellowship courses in ophthalmology. The other uh, fourth reason I thought was the ophthalmology was became a window for the body. So all peripheral, all of the uh, other parts of uh, medicines were referring cases to us. For example, neurologist, neurosurgeon, radiologist were referring cases on neuroophthalmology and uh, endocrinologist started referring thyroid, thymus and pituitary and uh, the metabolic dysfunctions physician started referring to them and immunologist referring cases. So almost all the specialties in the body uh, had some representation in the eye so that our pride went up lately. So ophthalmology started becoming an attractive specialty for young doctors, but when we joined, it was not so. Now, coming to the patient's approach, what have the changed now? Now, in 70s, when we started practice, you can see the ophthalmologist's pride, confidence, smile, that little bit of ego. And the patient on your right side, very humble, very sitting very quietly and says, the doctor is asking, what is your problem? The doctor, I'm not able to see well in both eyes. I've come here to see you what best you could do. You're like my God. So total surrender of the patient to the doctor as we surrender to the God for thing. But in 2000, the whole thing changed. The patient, the doctor again is asking, what is your problem? And the patient says, I have immature cataract in my right eye and please do FACO with foldable lens. Let me know what lens you're going to put. The trust is not there. That modesty was not there. And the doctor is considered as a technician. That was because of the technology and the great awareness among the patients. Now, coming to the medical record, all these changes I have seen in my ophthalmic journey. We have seen a white piece of white paper in 60 and patient used to keep it very carefully. Subsequently, a white paper with a seal was our case sheet. Then from we had a regular case sheets where we had coloring code for all the specialities. And then, then for the last two years, the EMR has come. Somehow my generation or myself, I'm not able to accept it because there is no contact between the eyes of the technician or the doctor to the patient. So that is the trend that we are going through. Coming to the equipments, main instruments, we could manage our life with torchlight. Dr. Vengatsami is examining a patient in a camp with the torchlight and direct ophthalmoscope, shiard stonometer, trial set, and basic surgical instruments. With the above instruments, we were able to diagnose, treat most of the eye problems. Today, we have all the sophisticated instruments, equipments, starting from slit clamp, custom made operating microscope. I was told there are some microscopes listen to doctor's command.
Madam, you are muted. Madam, Madam. muted. Yes, ma'am. Carry on, please, ma'am. Is it clear now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The recent advances, I'm sorry, one. Now we have OCT, all those investigations are available. I hardly see any patient coming with any complaint. Will not leave the hospital without undergoing an OCT. The common diseases, what we saw those days, were infections like conjunctivitis, corneal ulcers, dacryocystitis, and endophthalmitis, refractory error, and cataract, especially mature to hypermature, and glaucoma and detachment where it came in advanced cases because the diagnosis became much later because of lack of knowledge and equipments. And rare diseases, of course, diabetic retinopathy we have seen, but was not, it didn't have much importance those days. And there was no classification. And whatever, any changes in the macula, we call it macular degeneration. ARMD, autoimmune disease, dry eye. I've never heard of dry eye during my ophthalmic practice. Today, all these diseases have become so chronic and few of these diseases are common cause of blindness. The type of cataract we saw, mature, pearly white in both eyes. And patients, when they come with bilateral mature cataract, we used to do intracapsular cataract extraction and give a plus 10 glasses. And you can see a divine smile in their faces. But today, very early cataract, hard to diagnose a cataract. Patients come with 6.9 or 6.6 partial. And even with your best surgery, they are not that happy as we used to do in aphakic patients. The technique we used to do naked eye with the naked eye. You can see Dr. Bengatsami is using a loop to uh, perform surgery under a torchlight in 60s. And microsurgery started in 84. Today, we have any number of sophistications in the surgical microscopes. Now, cataract surgery technique also changed in our period. We started ECCE, no suture. Then ICCE seven or eight sutures, like almost like a keratoplasty. Then SICS in 90 and FACO and FEMTO. But between SICS, FACO and FEMTO, the quality of vision is not that great, but still we are being completely dependent on the modern technology to convince our patients. In our days, the patients were used to stay for 10 days, in the hospital, in supine position with the sandbags on either side, because there were no sutures. With sutures, they were staying three days. But for the last few years, they go home in 10 days. And we ophthalmologists took as a pride by sending them as early as possible. Regarding optical dispensing, lots of changes have occurred. Monofocal, bifocal, trifocal, progressive, which is also suitable according to the age and occupation. The consultation fee, those days we were charging 10 rupees. Today we charge 100, it this varies. So earlier, almost all ophthalmologists were general ophthalmologists. They were practicing, they were seeing all types of cases and very hardly referral system was there. Now there are every subspeciality, every structure has a subspeciality. And this results in extra time and cost to the patient, thus making the process very complex. So out of all these things, what did we gain? We have gained a lot with technology, a lot. It's an equipment, new surgeries, new investigations, new drugs. Our work has become very simple. We can see more number of patients. We could diagnose perfectly and we could start the treatment early. We could do anything through teleophthalmology and we could give training to young ophthalmologists. We used to, they used to assist us in those days. Then we used to handhold them for a few cases and then they will do a few steps individually. So it took a little longer time. Today we have a lot of simulators. So ultimately they, they are able to learn in a quicker time. 
and publications and research work have increased. So these are all the main things we have gained after improved technology. What did we lose? We have lost many things. We have lost connection with the patient. We do not have time in collecting patient's history. We hardly see the face of the patient. We hardly examine the patient clinically. We hardly communicate to the patient. With modern equipment were not available in the earlier days, doctors depend on their experience, intuitions, and clinical knowledge to arrive at a diagnosis. As a neuro-ophthalmologist, my teachers have trained me how to use your clinical skill. For example, how the patient is walking, how the patient is looking, how the patient is blinking. So we used to do a simple pupillary examination, fundus examination, and field study to come to diagnose um, nature of lesion, location of the lesion, and lateralizing the lesion. It used to be like a treasure hunt. Now, before we see the patient, we see the scan to get a quick uh, diagnosis. So as a result, we fail to apply our clinical knowledge or acumen and our decision-making skills have gone down. Always remember, the equipment by itself cannot diagnose a case or perform surgery. What matters is the doctor's competency, knowledge and approach towards patients. The entire world is fighting today unitedly against coronavirus. In spite of having all the most modern technology, we are still stuck with the virus, though a year has passed since its outbreak. We think we are progressing with technology. We may continue to have such similar shocks in future. We are ourselves are responsible. Situations like this are nature's strong reminders to us that it is time to return to nature, hold on to our traditions, and above all, practice humanity in all aspects. Finally, being of service to God and humanity means going well beyond the sophistication of the best technology to the humble demonstration of courtesy and compassion to each patient whom we serve. This is the only profession we, were give, we, are, we can serve and earn money. And this profession gives us a lot of trust and pride and respect among the community. To summarize, I'm not against technology. Technology is always welcoming and we should have it. You are all the young ophthalmologists are very lucky to have technology that helps a lot in eye care. At the same time, we should always keep in mind that we should not go away from the patient in the name of using technology. Be empathetic to your patients maintain a connect with them, you will surely reach the heights in your professional life and your personal life also will be successful. Thank you once again for giving this great opportunity to allow me to share my ophthalmic journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much, madam. Your words were so profound that all of us have started looking at what we are doing today. And I'm sure these words will help us to lead to a better future for every one of us in Afghanistan. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. I request now Dr. Namrata Sharma to introduce Dr. Gulapali Rao, for it is in Dr. Gulapali Rao's name that the AIOS Gulapali Rao Endowment Lecture is. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Partha. It is a privilege for me and an honor for me uh, to introduce this giant in ophthalmology who's a teacher of teachers, a mentor of mentors, and truly a legend in the field of ophthalmology. I met Dr. Gunapali and Rao in 1995 in World Congress, Cornea, not in India, but in the in, in US, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. And that was my first encounter with him when he was presenting uh, in the World Congress, Cornea. And uh, since then, uh, it has been uh, many years of interactions and deliberations together. Dr. Gulapalli and Rao needs no introduction at all. He's the founder chair of the LV Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad, a tall institute made by a very tall person, which is standing very tall. 
After a successful career in the US as an academic ophthalmologist, in 1987, Dr. G. N. Rao established the L. V. Prasad Institute in Hyderabad 31 years ago and is the founder and chair of that institute. He received his basic medical education in Guntur, Andhra Pradesh, and completed his postgraduate residency training at my alma mater, Dr. Rajendra Prasad Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. In the US, he trained at the Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston and later at the School of Medicine. University of Rochester, where he continued on the faculty until 1986. He's been one of the few who's come back from US to his own land to build his, build his own institute and to serve his own people. His academic and research achievements are known to everyone. He has honorary doctorates from the University of Melbourne and University of New South Wales, Australia, Dr. NTR University of Health Sciences, India, University of Bradford, UK, and Geetham University, India. He's been the president of Academia Ophthalmologica Internationalis, group of 80 of the most eminent academicians in ophthalmology in the world, a visiting professor to many universities in US, Europe, Australia, and Asia. Published many hundreds of papers in the peer-reviewed international journals, has been on editorial board of several international journals of ophthalmology, is the fellow course surgeon of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Glasgow, fellow of two of the science academies of India and of the National Academy of Medical Sciences, former Secretary General and later Chair of the Board and CEO of the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness, in which he played a pivotal role in developing and fostering the global initiative to eliminate avoidable blindness along with WHO Vision 2020, the right to sight in partnership with the WHO. He is, on the board, he is on the board of trustees of International Council of Ophthalmology and board of many national and international organizations. To his credit are numerous named awards from all over the world. Norman Award from the International Council of Ophthalmology for Outstanding Global Leadership in Eye Care. Bernardo Street Gold Medal from Academia Ophthalmologica Internationalis. Uh, Kufar Award from ARHO for outstanding accomplishments as a researcher, ophthalmologist, and humanitarian. Joe's Rizal Medal from the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. World Congress Cornea Medal from International Cornea Society, uh, which, which is among the first and for outstanding contributions in the field of cornea. International Blindness Prevention Award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Pissart Award by the Lighthouse International New York. Outstanding Humanitarian Service Award from American Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, Alcon Keynote Lecture from Arvo, Barry Jones Lecture of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists UK, three awards by the All India Ophthalmological Society and Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, First Association of Eye Banks of Asia Award at the Asia Cornea Society Scientific Meeting of the Asia Cornea Foundation, and many more awards which are not uh, written here. Outstanding contribution is that he was inducted into the Ophthalmology Hall of Fame at the meeting of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery in Los Angeles. Only 57 ophthalmologists from around the world have been inducted into this Hall of Fame, and he was the first Indian to do so. He was inducted as Commander Order of the Star of Africa for Distinguished Service to the Republic of Liberia and to Africa in Public Service and Sciences by President of Republic of Liberia. And we are honored to we were honored to give him the lifetime achievement award by the all india ophthalmological society as well so with this uh, we are now going to have the dr g n rao endowment award thank you sir for giving your consent for this and over to the awardee now uh, for this award thank you so thank you Namrata for that uh, very generous introduction. You have wasted a lot of time. <laughs> no, no, this is inspiration was, for the youngsters. Yeah. Uh, Nag. No, 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 Nag. it is always an inspiration. You are, you are an inspiration. Oh. So it's a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce uh, this year's <clears throat> awardee, Dr. Bhupendra Kumar Jain, a man of... Uh, unusual gifts and unusual talents. Somebody who has uh, taken the road not taken, going into the hinterlands of India 
when he could have gone to any metropolitan city of India and made a fortune for himself. To the hinterlands of UP, Madhya Pradesh, and created an outstanding institution. An institution that will be an inspiration for all of us in this generation and will remain an inspiration to generations of ophthalmologists yet to come. Because he did what most of us could not. If we think about it, the most magnitude of the problem of blindness and vision impairment is in the remote rural and tribal areas. And here is a champion that has actually decided to spend his life among these people and contribute to their welfare through restoration and preservation of sight in those communities. While doing that, he has never forgotten the idea of excellence. The institution he built today is a testimonial to the quality of eye care that anywhere one could practice, both in volume as well as quality, it is an outstanding institution. Dr. Jain, as a person, is simple, humble, and again, a role model to the future generations. In addition to his education in ophthalmology and his contributions to ophthalmology, he is vision extended far beyond that, far beyond ophthalmology, eye care, health care, into education and into community development in the surrounding areas of Chitrakoot where he is located. So we are honoring today a gentleman who, we, who belongs to that very rare breed of people who committed his life for improving the lives of millions of people that are neglected, the group of neglected population around the world. And I salute him and I personally feel honored that something associated with my name today is going to be shared by him. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much. And uh, I would request now Dr. B.K. Jain to... I would request now Dr. B.K. Jain if the endowment lecture, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rao, for your kind words. And at the outset, let me express my sincere gratitude the team of All India Ophthalmic Society for this great honor in the name of Dr. G. N. Rao, the true visionary ophthalmologist. All advancement in ophthalmic science must serve the alleviation of human suffering. Let me share our story with the same base. Let me begin with the briefing. How do I got the opportunity to work with three Sadhguru Seva Sankhtar founded by Param Pujaran Chodaji Maharaj. I was born in a place called Satna, Madhya Pradesh, and I was fortunate to have a darshan of Gurudev in the year 1959, a saint who used to organize mega surgical eye camps during that time in the nearby place, including in my hometown, Satna, and he was based at the Chitrakoot. After that, I visited Chitrakoot in 1963, and somehow the place attracted me and I was hopeful to come back to Chitrupu in any possible ways. As the year gone, Gurudev stabilized the trust to run his charitable activity, whereas I was decided to become a doctor and did my MBBS in Riva and PG from Mumbai. It was in the year 1974, I shifted to Chitrupu with an opportunity to work for the trust. Let us see. 
what are the challenges we have faced in the initial stage? Being remotely located in the very backward region, challenges were many to provide quality eye care to the rural masses. Each phase of our journey, we were having unique challenge. In the beginning, it was about ensuring basic amenity to the employee, then the problem of the financial constraint, employee retention, and also to ensure we are working together with the advancement in the eye care. I realized these challenges can only be taken if we approach with some stabilized core value and philosophies. Let me share this key philosophy, which I have learned and implemented with the blessing of Gurudev, trustees, Guru Bhai, Bahan, and my senior, and I especially remember to Dr. B. Let me explain my first philosophy in the detail. I had great difficulty to convince my family on my decision to live in the Chitrakoot and the initial phase. It was difficult in all sense. But what I found, as you start living, you will find way to improve your surrounding with support. Like in the initial stage, we had difficulty in electricity, water, and also to procure supply for delay needs. But that got settled with constant effort and teamwork. And today, in the 250-acre campus, there are about 2,000 people residing in our campus with the deep satisfaction. As there was no school in the nearby area, and I had to make my son, elder one, join in a boarding in Panchigini, Maharashtra. But then I realized not everyone may be able to do this and unless we have a school for children, retention of employees at the Chitkut will be difficult. In the early 1980, we have opened a school and I also ensured my son, you may all know him today, Dr. Ilesh Jain, joined the same Hindi medium school as this is the only way to show the faith on the quality of education of the newly built school. Today, we have well established both Hindi and English medium school with more than 3,000 child enrollment. But I also realize, even with all this exceptional initiative, we still have some rural life situation to cope with. For that, I believe the family must be created consciously helpful. Eventually, people also appreciate and come forward to support you further, like the recreation club supported by Infosys Foundation, followed to the visa with Mrs. Sudha Murthy. And when your approach is a holistic, retention becomes easy. From our dependency to volunteer ophthalmologists, today we have more than 100 ophthalmologists to work full time with us. What I want to emphasize here is that retain the people with the skill in challenging area, we need to ensure their, their holistic approach. Good. The next is our approach always should be futuristic. The reason biggest challenge was lack of health infrastructure. In 72, we have started with a small dispensary in Mandi, as there was no healthcare infrastructure. Immediate to that, we could stabilize 25 better hospitals separately. And later, this upgraded to full-fledged general hospital. And I can wing was a small department in the hospital, working mainly in the winter season. Seasonal imbalance was a great challenge. And May, many were not confident about a separate eye hospital. And the year 2000, we come with a specialized infrastructure for the eye care with the hope to reduce the seasonal imbalance. Our service delivery model was able to tackle the problem and seasonal imbalance was greatly reduced. With volume increase and reduce the seasonal imbalance, we have planned for the next infra development to welcome the future. This upgrade was helpful to get NABH. Infrastructure and people with dedication alone cannot make things work. You need to be competent in what you are doing. It is a fact that in initial stage to support the doctor, we had to largely rely on the rural individual and volunteer. But eventually, we devised mechanism to ensure rural talent or identify and groom as an eye care professional. Here, 1996, we have stabilized School of Ophthalmic Science, benefited more than 1,000 students so far. Here, 1997, we have stabilized School of Nursery, benefited more than 1,000 students so far. 
year 2002, we have established Institute of Computer Science, benefited more than 500 students so far. So far in various segment trained close to 4,000 rural youth, becoming a self-sustainability, very crucial to bring this mindset, especially those who are in the NGO sector. Till 1998, we are completely dependent on the donor, and I was totally not convinced to depend on the donor alone. Year 1998, we introduced segmented pricing system. It was when, in the year 2006, Dr. Abdul Kalam visited Chitrakut and asked the question of how to difference the poor and rich. I have so I had adopted the model of the railway system, as it is also never asked caste, creed, religion, social factor, economical factor, in the same way, any while availing the services. We have an additional free bogey, and rest is the same. People can choose on their capacity. The latest figure so the concept is well taken. Help has to become financially self-sustainable for our operational expenditure. All these things are made possible only because of the care and support we have received from the community. With this stabilized community support for the effective reach in, we are using all model of the eye care delivery. Annually, we conduct over 4,000 rural reach out camps across 35 most backward districts pre COVID times. We also have a good number of vision centers spread across MP, UP, and Rajasthan. Right from the beginning, the organizations were conscious on quality those days during mega surgical camp. Prior to surgery, patients used to give bath, new cloth to ensure hygiene and comfort. And we moved with the time. Since 2006, we are ISO certified. In year 2021, we become one of the largest eye care center with the NABH. We believe in innovation and Catrick Backlog Free Campaign was one of the such innovation. It was a practical approach to scale up the volume of the Catrick surgery and reduce the blindness prevalence. With this approach, we could declare five districts as a Catrick Blindness Backlog Free. And I was fortunate to give update to honorary Joint Secretary, Mr. Lava Grawal, and Dr. Pramila Gupta three years before, and glad that it is adopted and getting implemented by NPCD now. So these were the integral philosophy. We could ensure the reach of the advanced eye care to the rural masses. So we have been proved up about five decades. And let us quickly see where we stand with us in the eye care organization today. Very proud to say, we are one of the largest rural eye hospital. When I say large, yes, it is glad that we care about a million patients every year pre COVID times. Also, today, context, we also do the most number of cataract surgery in India as a single institute. And that number is almost equal to one third of what the whole NHS do. And we are not just cataract focused, a comprehensive setup with the high volume, high quality in advanced surgery. We have one of the largest IOT complex in the world with 25 modular eye operation theaters. We are also government of India recognized postgraduate center with the international affiliation. And we train ophthalmologists from worldwide and various country benefiters so far. We also ensure our learning are helping other similar organizations through capacity building jointly organized with the Seva Foundation USA. Every year we publish several papers in key journals just to show you our growth story in a nutshell. Serve 9.2 million outpatient surgery in 18 years, perform 1.6 million surgery in 18 years. Yes, no doubt we are comprehensive eye care setup with the high volume in all specialty. And you can see how much our eye care services grown from then. And the impact and benefit is the same as the countless. Before I conclude, I want to show you the real impact of our eye care service growth story. Because what you have seen as an impact on what all we have done, just a tip of the iceberg. I want to show you a brief film as you visualize the greater impact we could brought in through this eye care growth.
Most of them are poor. They have nothing. They come in droves from far and near. Life's difficult when you roam and lose excite. Their search comes to an end when they arrive at the right place. It's something you feel when you have belief. Narusa, faith, vishwas, confidence, or yakin all portray the underlying sentiment of the Sri Sadhguru Seva San Trust. For 50 years, the Trust has been relentlessly serving the poor in Chitrakoot with its activities that range from healthcare to education, from women's empowerment to cattle care, from daily development to agriculture. The story of the trust dates back to the early 1950s when Gurudev Parampur Sri Ranchur Das Ji Maharaj organized free eye camps and relief work during natural calamities in Central India. And in 1968, formally initiated the trust with the goal to provide food for the hungry, clothes for the needy, and sight to the blind. <laughs> Here, the Sadhguru Nature Chikitsala or the Ali Hospital is a modern day building that's an oasis drawing tens of thousands of people from the rural areas from nearby states. But what stands out, not only in India, but perhaps the world, is the complex that houses 26 modular operation theatres. In many months, they conduct about a thousand surgeries in a day. From stadium site to stadium labs, the trust has general hospitals. Now, moving on to education. To begin with, there is the Sri Ram Sanskrit Mahavidyale that Gurudev started, is keeping alive one of the oldest languages in the world. Next is the Sangeet Vidyala in Chitrakoo, where Indian classical music is the core of the syllabus. For conventional education, a primary and an intermediate school enrolled from the economically weak sections of society. <laughs> Because what you have seen as an impact on what all we have done, it just as a tip of the 
before i conclude i went to so i believe an advocate holistic approach for the rural development and this is combination of the science and faith science of ophthalmology is the advancement of eye care with the rich accessible available and affordable to all and my philosophy as good day philosophy quality eye care for all we believe in the combination of the science and faith and it is that this holistic approach help us to achieve this magnificent success in this most rural and remote area i wish to conclude this great message for all of us thank you all thank you again team all india ophthalmic society for this great opportunity and especially thanks to dr parth thank you thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you so much for being with us and for your inspiring words and i think uh, partha the great thing dr pk jain has done is uh, uh, hello yeah or lp agarwal endowment lecture i would request dr namrata sharma to introduce dr lp agarwal please By the time Namrata comes, I'm just forward to convey that uh, it's a treat to visualize what Dr. B.K. Jain has done, and I've seen that eight by eight room where he started his career, and I think he is a Mumbai product. So, uh, since Dr. Namrata is not there, without wasting time, may I introduce uh, Dr. L.P. Agarwal? Professor Lalit Prakash Agarwal drafted the national program for prevention of visual impairment and control of blindness. in india and the first kind in the world with his vision well ahead in time he brought the concept of the sub speciality in indian ophthalmology he founded dr rajendra prashad center of ophthalmic sciences the apex government institution of india his contributions to modern indian ophthalmology is so profound that we may not be mistaken if we call him the father of modern indian ophthalmology i request dr t s surendran and i would request uh, dr mahipal sir to introduce dr t s surendran for the lp agarwal aios endowment lecture for 2021 mahipal sir mahipal is not there mahipal is not there parta All right. I will introduce the doctor. I can introduce uh, Surendran. Okay, go ahead, sir. Please. Uh, one second. I'll just take it. You send it here. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Surendran because uh, I worked with him, and he, his brother and my brother are uh, classmates. So we have visited when I was in sixth standard only to his house. He's a uh, uh, he's a MBBS DO from Madras Medical College. and i am phil and frcs edinburgh he is the current position is vice chairman and director of pediatric ophthalmology director of argus international reach project trustee and board member of shankaranetra la chennai and shankaradev netra la gohati assam chairman institutional committee for stem cell research common stanley hospital chennai and board member of chennai breast cancer research foundation and he has been president of stem small cell society and pediatric ophthalmic society of india for 6 years has had training with dr marshall parks and alan scott usa has 40 years of experience with ophthalmology mainly pediatric botox contact lens and low vision aid and taught students of both graduates in ophthalmology and optometry including me and uh, awards is a national colonel rangachari gold medal from all india ophthalmic society for the same award from rotary club from joseph yana award from tnoa best doctor award from dr mgr medical university lifetime achievement award from civil small society dr badnath gold medal from tnoa lifetime achievement award from vista india lifetime achievement award from tnoa fonde lifetime achievement from lions club 55 national conferences 73 lectures 13 instruction courses membership in several international organizations conducted screen camps and according to me i know he is the only ophthalmologist who is not doing cataract apart from me and he is the only ophthalmologist doing screen surgery and i think he always tells the 
that he can close his eyes and do the spin surgery the fastest in the world and i think i have a witness to it and apart from all that he's a great human being and a great man who always put joke with dr badinath when everything was going helter skelter in in madras when i think whenever we come out of dr badinath's room and he is there always to not only console a joke and make us comfortable and i think i know him from probably 1970s so here we have dr sudhendra thank you very much sir sudhendra sir we all fame noisily call him tss and it can start with a joke sir i know it's a very serious uh, uh, award session but i think uh, we are happy to have your you are always witty and that's what we like about you apart from your uh, uh, astounding knowledge you have in pediatric ophthalmology i am a changed man no yeah. jokes and thanks for the introduction i am deeply indebted to my fellow professionals and the all india ophthalmic society for the honor and opportunity to deliver the second lp agarwal endowment lecture for this year 2021 this privilege and honor was best upon best of upon dr gulapalli rao who just in time physically delivered this lecture in february 2020 we now must content ourselves with the virtual mode given the uncertainty that we are facing thanks to the modern day technologies of uh, virtual meetings that enable us to seamlessly connect all i believe that it is in this time of crisis that we are pushed to our limits and we discover hitherto untested abilities emerging to bring solutions to the different problems of the community i have seen the power of strong challenges that changing scenarios bring about in our own profession of ophthalmology that pushes to quickly adapt to newer methods and procedures the topic for dr lp agarwal this year is science of ophthalmology and my philosophy and uh, this was little unique to me uh, when uh, dr parthab this was spoke to me and told this topic i am honored that uh, aos has given me this opportunity to reflect on my philosophy in the realm of science of ophthalmology at the outset my philosophy i must admit is slightly colored i mean i spent my entire professional life as a surgeon in a world class non profit organization yes for more than 40 years i will come to that later after lp agarwal in whose memory this endowment lecture series or instituted by aos was an enthusiastic teacher and a meticulous clinician professor lp agarwal was a visionary who planned to the to the first blindness control program to be started in india and also as the founder chief of rp center all all the institute of medical science he was the dean of all the institute new delhi from 77 to 1979 and thereafter director of aims from 79 to 84 i was fortunate to be his student to attend some lectures and it is indeed a great honor to deliver this lecture in his fond memory i am once again thankful to the aois for this great honor i have 15 minutes to deliver this lecture but i was still sick to the stick to the timelines i must mention here that the prestigious endowment lecture the name of the eminent doctor and teacher 15 minutes is a too short time as a gesture to the next speaker next year i humbly request the aos to enhance the time suitably but today i'll try and compress my thoughts within the prescribed time at the outset i must mention that this lecture is not a high end technical presentation to an already highly experienced competent and talented group of fellow professionals who have been serving the community very well i wish to dwell upon the in this short time certain important aspects of our profession which i strongly believe in so that the aspiring students and the future generation of ophthalmologists can arise and awake and uh, stop not till the goal is reached as per swami vivekananda whom i follow first about the science of ophthalmology the existence of eyes is so fundamental to our profession that we often do not pay any attention to its evolution i do not wish to go back to the classroom lecture but it is important to absorb and respect the contribution by stalwarts of yester years to whom we owe a lot sight is an evolutionary gift the science behind eyes has evolved over the past 
many million years along with the science of medicine. Ophthalmology is only a branch of medical sciences handling both medical and surgical solutions of the disease of the human eye. That's why I've chosen ophthalmology. The eye has been the subject of conflicting interpretations since ancient time. The oldest evidence of surgical practice by Shushruta almost two million ago opened the windows of professional surgical practice. Only a practicing surgeon could have given such detailed description and surgical techniques. Shushruta Shashmita was elaborately described couching a technique to manage the cataract. This Samishta also ex has excerpts on code of ethics for teachers and students, implying the significance of Guru Shishya Paramahampara, Paramapara, and how important it is that a healthcare professional imparts education and passes his knowledge and skills to the students through vigorous training. I am deeply fascinated by this code as it resonates with my philosophy of lifelong learning and imparting learning. Yes, we have come a long way from there, but it is impossible to deny that some of us in the older generation of doctors sometimes wake up to the reality of the complexity of the human anatomy and unconditionally salute the creator. The, then came Kepler. He was a German astronomer, mathematician and astrologer. And uh, in that era of 17th century, there was no clear distinction between astronomy and astrology. He changed the whole picture. We all know about the contributions he made as an astronomer to the science of ophthalmology. Many of us know how in recent years, the Keplerian telescope has assumed a practical significance of ophthalmological optics. It offers a significantly higher magnification than any other optical visual aid for indiv individuals with impaired vision. In this era, new theories of uh, sight place greater emphasis on the fusion of anatomy and geometry in studying the eye. Kepler created the idea of the retinal image as an image that had been reversed and then restored through the process of reflection and refraction like how the lens in Kepler's telescope, which showed the heavens upside down. Why I request you to call this is because we need to appreciate that the science of ophthalmology has gone through a rigorous, tedious and long journey, which has today produced so many specialities dealing with the diseases of the eye. The core picture of most ophthalmologists deal with the health conditions that affect the eye, which today has so many specialities. If I outline the list of subspecialities, it could be a sizable amount of my time, but each one of us in the field understand our limitations and respectfully do not stay in areas where we are unfamiliar. Such is the level of acute specialization. When it comes to the world of ophthalmological instruments and gadgets, there are numerous state-of-the-art equipment that enhance the ability of the doctor. Take, for example, the retinal camera, the photocoagulator, the photocoagulating laser, the corneal cell counter, wave front abrometer, and uh, not to forget the handheld keratometer for which I got the Colonel Rangachari Award. Another major help in the digitized patient records and uh, workflows. They have significantly boosted the capabilities of doctors in enhancing diagnostic skills and appropriate and timely treatment protocols. I commend organizations like Orbis that partnered with the institutions to combat blindness through the Flying Eye Hospital and other models of enabling technologies, more so in the pediatric speciality. Community of ophthalmology, the state of the art, mobile eye surgical unit, such as the MISU, when, wherein we can operate, which is the initiative of Shankar Netralia and is the only institution to operate in the bus. And tele-video consultations, tele-ophthalmology have all taken modern eye care to far-flung areas, tribal areas where poor patients have no means to come to the base hospitals. It's important for forest ophthalmologists to do some blue sky thinking and blue sky research too. While it is important to continue our daily professional pursuits, we have a responsibility to direct young minds to the field of research, research that changes lives. Technology is now advanced. We can now integrate the gene and comprehend how gene influences the cell behavior and understanding by imaging tissues at very high resolutions. 
the eye is a window and through that we can see through to a single cell level to understand its function we are now moving to areas of personalized therapy before i shift my focus to my own philosophy i think it is important that i, I touch upon the evolving science of vision the science of ophthalmology and the science of vision are distinct but deal with scientific study of vision and its convergence is now driving investigative ophthalmology vision science also encompasses non human organism that process visual information visual perception and its ramification in the communication and artificial intelligence systems a few of the mark eye institutions in india have significantly contributed to research in the field of eye diseases but these are grossly inadequate i believe that we need national organization like ro driven by the joint efforts on a few of the mark eye institutions in the country ro is the largest and most respected eye and vision research organization in the world based out in maryland usa ro advances research worldwide in understanding the visual system and preventing treating and curing the disorders we need to inculcate a culture of research starting from our medical school onwards so that select talents can pursue serious work under the guidance of competent scientists and ophthalmologists the compensation for these talents should be sufficiently attractive to prevent them from taking up the regular jobs unless we take conscious steps in this direction serious research will suffer we have a duty to give back to the scientific world from which we have taken so much for our own benefits and for the benefit of the patient community ophthalmologists in general have shown the grit and enterprise to establish successful practices so why not collaborate for research now about about my own philosophy in the realm of the profession i had mentioned earlier that my philosophy the matter of bit color it's largely influenced by the eminent and strong personalities that i was fortunate to spend my time with the more than four decades such people not only sharpen your skills but also significantly influence your thinking and your very character i fondly recollect my own mentor dr s s badrinath with whom i continue to work even at this old age then dr g venkata swami dr gulapalli rao dr l p agarwal dr namparmar swami to name a few who have all made significant contributions to the science of ophthalmology when you work with such great stalwarts you become like a well seasoned pickle kept in the brine for ages with distinct color shape texture aroma and taste i hasn't hasn't to add that such objects to be pickled or hand picked by the chef themselves let me caution you here the word pickled is also a tricky word in the english language it has completely disastrous meaning when used in different contexts you can check it out but i meant it in the manner i have described and nothing more i am happy that i went through the grill as a reflect on the variegated experience i have gained as a professional surgeon as well as a compassionate human being my alma mater shankar netralia the temple of the eye is where i would like to begin as i travel through time in the convergence of cutting edge science of ophthalmology and uncompromising compassion the passion for both professional excellence and a deep sense of compassion is the hallmark and dna of institutions like shankar netralia shankar netralia is even today recognized for its significant contribution to the creation of knowledge with a sincere and serious focus on education training and research and training more than 1000 uh, fellows in ophthalmology in the field of eye care its goal is to address the nation's goal for defect free vision for all and i strongly believe that medicine and compassion go hand in hand apart from professional competence and skill which is given a medical professional whatever be his branch of specialization should have the following attributes also the first virtue is generosity the ability to be kind the second virtue is pure ethics the cleanliness of thought and action the third is tolerance the capacity for fairness the fourth is perseverance the willingness to be diligent the final and crucial one very important is accountability 
the willingness to accept responsibility. These virtues will empower the caregiver with a human heart. These virtues are indeed the core pillars of my philosophy. These fortified by my skills always will work for the benefit of the patient who trusts me implicitly. I also strongly believe that a serious medical practitioner should keep, keep himself up to date, teach and aid in the research projects. And uh, I conclude this lecture with uh, dwelling by philosophy. I must draw the attention of all my fellow ophthalmologists to the grave situation in the country and the slower growth, shrinking middle class. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Thank you for listening to my patiently. I may have exceeded my 15 minutes for a few minutes. I want to once again thank AOI for giving no, me... Sir, you have not exceeded. Wonderful uh, talk, uh, Dr. Surendran. And I think uh, amazing. And I all forgot to tell one thing because I read whatever Dr. Uh, Bishwas, uh, sorry, Dr. Partha Bishwas gave me. It is actually uh, the... You are the founding president of uh, Shankaranathala Alumni, which is the uh, Dr. Vedana's uh, product. And I think... Uh, you are one person who are, like, as you use the word pickled, I know the, what exactly you said. I think we have seen that happening. And I think you are a great sir. And I'm happy that I, I don't know, Dr. Badanath could not be here. But we are all, uh, I hope we can, uh, he can see the YouTube video later. Over to you, Bartha. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, uh, Natarajan, sir. Dr. T.S. Swindon, sir. Uh, thanks for all those wonderful words that you have spoken. It rekindles into every one of us the importance of the philosophy with which we should practice ophthalmology. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless. I come to the next lecture, and that is the AIOS Nam Paramal Sami 2021 Endowment Lecture to be delivered by Professor Mangat Dograso. May I have the pleasure of Dr. P. Nam Paramal Swami he is one of the founding members of the Arvind Eye Care System and is currently its Chairman Emeritus and Professor of Ophthalmology. Dr. Namparamal Swami started his career at the Government Rajaji Hospital Madurai. Then, after training in USA, he came back to Madurai and set up one of the greatest institutions, not only of India, but in the world today. Dr. Namparamal Swami has huge number of accolades and awards to his credit, including the Padma Shri Award by the Government of India, Lifetime Award by the All India Ophthalmological Society and Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association, Achievement Award by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, Dr. B.C. Roy National Award in the category of Eminent Medical Teacher in MCI. In 2010, Time Magazine listed him as one of among the 100 most influential people in the world. I have spent a small while at Aravindai Hospital also, apart from Shankanitralia, and I'm indebted to Nampar Swami sir for my career in ophthalmology. Dr. Nampar Swami sir, can you introduce Professor Mangat Dogra? Thank you very much. Uh the organizers of uh, this uh, lecture series. And I take this opportunity to take, thank the scientific committee and other office bearers of the prestigious AOS for having named one of the uh, lectures on my name. Thank you, it is a great honor for me. I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Mangat Dogra. He is a good friend of mine. He is a former professor and head of ophthalmology, chief of retina service of Advanced Eye Care Postgraduate Center, uh, Chandigarh. And he has worked under Dr. Amod Gupta. He is the former I mean, recipient of the same award last year. And he has done a postgraduate MS in ophthalmology in Chandigarh, and also he has done a veterinary fellowship in Maryland, Baltimore, and having done that veterinary fellowship, he has come and joined in the veterinary service.
for more than three decades, he has spent the whole time in veterinary services and patient services, and also in, is a great academician. And he has trained many people, many persons in the field of vitretina. And he is a great researcher, and he has got many papers on his credit. And he has at least 207 papers in peer-reviewed journals, and has written books of four books in his name. And uh, more than that, he has received more than 35 awards, variation awards in the field of international uh, field. And he has been the former president of International Society of India. And, and uh, his main work, even among the veterinary diseases, his interest has been the ROP. And he is the father figure of ROP, the evaluation, management, and the propaganda, dissemination of knowledge to the entire country, I will say that he has been. And so he is a great academician and researcher. And I'm very proud to introduce him. And uh, he is giving this uh, uh, endowment lecture on my name, and uh, I congratulate you, Dr. Mangat Dodra, and I am proud to introduce you for this the crowd. The, thank you very much. Dr. Mangat Dodra, sir? Yes. yes sir. Uh, is it? Uh, my screen is seen. Not yet, sir. Can you share? Let this? me let me let me share. Yeah, sorry. Yes, sir. It is shared. At the outset, I would like to thank AIOS, especially Dr. Partha Viswas is here, and the entire governing team, uh, those who thought me worthy of uh, having this great uh, endowment lecture, uh, which is named on a person whom I have just owed all my life and felt that he is a role model for so many of us, not only in this country, probably in many places in the world. I think uh, he has been already introduced by Partha at present, he's the chairman emeritus, and uh, he, you know, his education and other things is uh, way back. He worked with uh, Payman and then to Charles Skeepens, and you can see he's the founding member of the Arvind Ayak Care System, as well as uh, so many people are trained with him. Uh, Dr. Tara Prasad Das is here today. He's another one who has been trained by him. And uh, well, I remember when I had gone and they had invited me, he said, I'm going to only now after my retirement and become as a emeritus chairman, focus on the research. And we know most of the B-class research is coming out of this institution today. And that is what he has focused on. And we are proud of that. And we feel as Indian proud. I think his awards already been said I think from all over the world, as well as about his Padmashiri, as well as Bisuri, B, B Zero Award. Uh, I, I'm really honored, honored to have uh, got this. And that also after my mentor, Professor Amud Gupta delivered the first one last year. Uh, I'm also uh, going to little bit dwell on the same subject, which has been uh, uh, by my earlier uh, 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 endowment lectures uh, recipient, and I think science is a very uh, complicated thing. It involves so many things, so I'll not go. I think some of these have been touched earlier, so I'll just uh, move forward. So what do we uh, kind of know about a science? If we find something unusual and not feeling in unknown, then you start thinking, you dig into it, and try to find out that hidden treasure. 
And that is what basically in science uh, we understand and we do it. I think evolution already talked by Dr. Surindran here. He mentioned about Sushruta, the first ophthalmologist. Then Celsus, I was uh, in, during Roman Empire, he wrote the whole books. He was one of those. And then uh, uh, Egyptian here, Hel Hatham. In fact, uh, of course, we know about all these from Jax, Deviel, who was gave the extra capsule surgery, and Von Graffi and IOL, and we know FACO. I think all these people, they had an immense contribution. So as far as the science of ophthalmology is concerned, we are all very lucky. We work in a field which has a dual satisfaction. We treat both, we do both surgery as well as do the medical part, as well as we treat everybody from a neonatal period till the last decade, all the way. That is something beauty of ophthalmology. Of course, we all know about this. I'm not uh, getting into this, that majority of the diseases which we treat, they impact the elderly most, but the refractive errors, probably refractive error industry is so big, many people, they just survive on that. I think Ma'am Nachia talked about the neurological problem. We are the one, we diagnose many neurological and systemic diseases, first of all. So I think it's a great branch. And ophthalmology is something which you can practice solo. You can have a single specialty, subspecialty, just practice. And you can work for a big corporate hospitals or a other organization like what was mentioned about the Chitrakoot and Arvindai Hospital. At present, majority of the residents are women. I think this is a great thing. Everywhere you find we have, because this is rewarding, as well as your personal life, there's a flexibility, convenience. That's why probably women are more and more into this. And the earning potential is immense. It depends because how much volume you get. I would just talk about, since I was supposed to talk about my philosophy, my first 13 years of life were spent in a remote village of Himachal Pradesh. This was uh, in a very primitive school. You know, I belong to a very uh, poor, illiterate farmer's family, those who were very hardworking. And that time my area was really very much backward. And I, I am the eldest of the nine siblings. And I would fetch uh, grass for the domestic animal, wash clothes, cook food. Even when I was just a little boy, wanted to help my parents. But I think this did the biggest thing for me because this appreciation of my hard work by the villagers motivated me to do more and more. And I would indulge in more. And that appreciation helped me to work hard as well as that was the initial period when I never knew anything about the life. I would walk barefoot in those hilly areas to school. Only in winter we'll get one um, shoe because it used to snow there. My parents were very keen that I should become a doctor or healthcare personnel. We never used to see a doctor. I, we, I have not seen a doctor during my childhood. There used to be some kind of a person who was not a doctor like an in-between person who would go give injection like and do things. So they wanted, and that people used to fall sick and die. And most of our relatives and family friends discouraged me to take this medicine because they thought it is a very difficult branch. I am going from village, what will I do? And But I knew that running water never flows back. I have to fulfill the promise of my parents. So I left no st stone unturned. Here are my parents. I lost my father in 1993. My mother is still there. And, uh, and my journey with ophthalmology started in Government Medical College, Simla. In third year only, I thought I'll take up ophthalmology. And that was MBBS. Can you imagine? I left the radiology seat in PGI Chandigarh and competed again to get ophthalmology. And my, as far as my journey in retina is concerned, I did comprehensive ophthalmology with special interest in retina for almost 13 years. Because that time, that is the way it used to, and we used to refer from all over the cases to Shankar Nitra Chennai for all vitreoretinal surgery. The major breakthrough for me came uh, with a fellowship which has been mentioned by a name uh, in University of Maryland, and that is where I was. And I owe a lot to these people, especially Dr. Vinod Lakhanpal here, Stanley Shockett, who's uh, Shockett shunt and Shockett depressor, you know, and Mark Preslin, who taught me. ROP that time here. I am here, standing here in front of the university logo. Well, friends, 
I would also quote this Robert Frost because this is very apt for me, the way I took my life subsequently. Two roads diverged in a wood and I took the least traveled and that has made all the difference. So I, my philosophy was that I helped to establish, along with Dr. Gupta, I got such a great mentor, senior teacher. We established first class retinal unit, world class in Chandigarh. And nobody would go from there now later on. And I took the least traveled road of ROP and that changed my life at least. The most powerful draw for me on this was childhood blindness. It became a biggest passion, mission and obsession for me. And I became totally focused in, on this almost in the last 30 years. And my journey started with ROP in 1989 in Baltimore and subsequently in PGI 1991 onwards. And that time, you know, ROP was one para like retrolandral fibroplasia as a differential diagnosis of retinoblastoma. That's it. And it never used to happen in our country. And I, the, he is my contemporary, six months my junior in PGI Chandigarh for residency, Dr. Lingam Bhopal. He came in 1992 USA. I was doing fellowship. He said he started seeing some ROP. Better concentrate on that. And this is subsequently we met in, uh, we have grown old. He is one year younger to me. He looks old even here. <laughs> So this is, I was very lucky to be in a place that was the first neonatal center of the country. You know, PGI has trained the 70% of the neonatologists for the entire country. These great people here, they are the fathers of neonatology in India. That's how I could do all this. And I was lucky to have a strong role model who led by example. Nobody else expected. I, right from Professor Jan, and then they provided all the opportunity, and they were they were full of innovation ideas. We always moved together, and the team spirit was the highest priority. That is what we believed in. I don't know how we had to sit like this. This never happens. This was never planned, and I was never supposed to. Our Professor Jan, our teacher, then subsequently, that's the how we became the chief of our center. It was never planned. It happened. Here is my professor from Simla, Professor Sofat, who supported me a lot. And here is young Dr. Garewal, where I work these days. It happened somehow and it had to happen. I'm so grateful that we had a great mentors. I, you can see them, how much they have done, how much they have contributed. During my entire uh, career, 90% of the thesis residents were on ROP. I doubled into research and also I try to kind of coordinate these. These were the two papers back to back by me and Gopal in 1995. This was also my uh, first thesis given in 92. And this is, I would like to cite Anand Vinekar, who's known world over. He stayed with me for six years, stayed with me. He came for ROP only. This has maximum number of citation among ROP studies from India. Already citations are more than 100 for a ROP paper. Can you imagine? And this paper led to change even in guidelines for Indians to two kgs and also changing uh, what was in the American guidelines. You would have missed so many cases. I think uh, I was fortunate to do a few things for the first time, treating babies through the wall of the incubator, which was published, and also propagating for the first time that we can use the same laser because we can't afford a separate laser diode. It's the same laser we use for diabetic retinopathy, for other things. And that is what we published first in 2010. And everybody now uses a green laser for... Uh, this is something which I am very proud. This is described by us from our center. This will become part of a classification, which is a process going on at this time, international classification. This is a new thing which was not described. So is this Pussy Zone 1. This also will be part of the international classification. This was towards end of my career. No, there is no exclusive study of a half zone or a posterior zone one. And of course, I encouraged a lot, and Anand especially, to have something cheap. Look at the cost here otherwise. 80, 90 lakhs to 15 lakhs. And uh, I think it works very well. It is available. It is affordable. And we can do a lot of things with this. Of course, to, when I was about to retire, I did. I think I, to my name would be, if people start doing it, all nasal me like this. You put a cannula 
sit on the nasal side, put cannula right into the center and operate from two sides, especially for entire detachment, which comes temporarily up. You don't sacrifice a lens here. And the reasons for the epidemic in India are very well known. I'll not dwell into that. We have the highest preterm birth in the world. We don't use, we use oxygen as well as these are some of the things we, we wrote an editorial for this in Indian pediatrics. And the, my philosophy has been always to associate with professional bodies, with all kinds of people around, as well as organize conferences and workshops. And I'm lucky here, uh, father of ROP, Michael Tracy is here. Anand also trained with him. He is the Michael Chang here. You see, he's been our friend. He's now the present director of National Eye Institute. And uh, of course, here, uh, we have a lot of people with whom I could interact. And uh, I was even a judge along with Michael Tracy and other big people uh, selected just because of my work. Even till recently, you can see, I was the only one from uh, Asian countries talking about middle income group country in March. And uh, well, by, I have been a member of the National Task Force by Ministry of India. And I have given 225 lectures. Most of the task force members are here. And we are also, we have formed the IORP Society. It made me the president. Dr. Natarajan is also here. This was the first when I took the first ever symposium, International Health by Vitoretna Society in Hamburg, Germany. And you can see all the stalwarts there. I, of course, spoke on ROP and others also spoke on various other things. So I published 54 papers, trained a lot of students all over. Even my son today, he's a vitreoretinal surgeon and he is in PGI. He also does vitreoretinal surgery and uveitis. He somehow doesn't love that much children. He says, dad, I can't do ROP. And this is, uh, was the full issue of the journal, which was published. There is something to do with PGI and ROP, I must say. I think all of us are from PGI. And these are the ROP major people. I think you can see here that some of it had to happen. We had to train in our, in our institution where I was trained. I became head of the department. I get bothered about this one five stage. And I must say here, I have all across the country. And because of this, every place where I was invited, I never refused just to educate, just to prevent that blindness, which is seen here. Well, friends, I'm finishing here the challenges with the same thing, which was also earlier mentioned by, uh, from Robert Frost by Dr. Surindran. And I thank all of you for patient hearing. I think among these galaxy of speakers, I've been so fortunate that I've been given, and especially on any, uh, Dr. Nam's name, whom I have always adored. And as I'm thankful again for uh, giving this honor to me. Thank you, sir. Mangat, sir. We are honored. We are privileged to have you as the lecturer. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We come to the next AIO's Dr. S.S. Badrinath 2021 Endowment Lecture to be delivered by Dr. Tara Prasad Das. Yeah. Dr. Natrajan, sir, can you yes. please introduce? Yes. Thank you. A great pleasure to introduce my mentor. And I think as uh, everybody does not need introduction, but I think uh, Dr. Gulapalli Rao is here, I think. Nag, you're there. And uh, I remember it was, it's a very uh, uh, a very disturbing uh, trend. And I'm glad Dr. Partha started this. The disturbing trend is there is a book called Third Death, which Dr. Nagpal always tells me. Usually the grandchildren will remember the grandfather then they don't remember the great grandfather and then the public figure he says one generation remembers gandhiji is the only one who remembered three generations or four generation and then now i think everybody says second october is a holiday and that's that's all they know so i think uh, dr Kula nak told me that uh, nowadays people don't know who is dr Vandanath and who's dr venkat sami and i think uh, that he told me in a conference in International Evaitis Conference in Goa when Nasinger was there. So I think the sessions are important for ophthalmologists who are training now and getting graduated. So Dr. Badna, my guru, Chairman Emeritus of Shankar born on 24th February 1940. We had, I think, that particular year, Dr. Nampar Sami and Dr. P. N. Nakpal. And he is the founder of, uh, chairman of 
emirates of shankarnath pale one of the uh, leading eye hospitals of uh, india is an elected fellow of national academy of medical sciences the words of shankaracharya the need to create a hospital with the missionary spirit inspired him to start a charitable hospital and shankaracharya told him that one badrinath should become thousand badrinath and a sangamed srinivas badrinath was born in triplicken a suburb of not a, it's a main part of uh, chennai his father is sri srinivas rao an engineer was employed in the drugs government his mother lakshmi devi was the daughter of an advocate from tamil nadu beginning his education late at age 7 due to a child in the padrina studied in a ps high school and sri ramakrishna mission high school and is complete his college education at loyola college 1955 to 1957 he lost both his parents while still in his teens and completed his medical student and the insurance money obtained from following the demise of his father he graduated from madras uh, medical college here yeah, i'm glad uh, uh, that uh, um, many of us including dr venish swami dr uh, myself uh, we are all alumni of madras medical college is more than 190 years now and he did his internship and a year of internal medicine residency at the glasgow hospital in new york following the study of basic sciences and ophthalmology in new york university he became a fellow of the royal college of surgeons canada he worked with dr charles stevens at the retina service and charles stevens stevens same where dr nam also was trained and father of modern retinal detachment surgery and he returned to india in 1970 and from 1970 for a period of 6 years he worked at the volunt health service chennai as a consultant he set up private practice in ophthalmology and retinal surgery at hm hospital and vijaya hospital and at the hm hospital he had a consulting room and the next room was dr pc reddy the founder of apollo hospital and i had the opportunity to see him in 1970 when he came and i was in seventh standard yes and uh, thanks to my father and grandfather who were ophthalmologists so dr ranger sami used to tell he was a, he, he knew my three generations so uh, he is the founder and chairman of uh, the emirate of shankarnath and uh, this uh, temple of eye with more than 300 crore hospital now and that's not important the whole thing is serving selflessly without any caste creed or religious consideration rank number 1 for i care in india and you can see him he came to uh, release the book called uh, insight uh, which was uh, in mumbai and uh, all people in mumbai adore him because most of the uh, gujarati and marwadi from mumbai have given the donation to shankarnath alaya and he has accolades padma shri b c roy all had his fellow badma bhushan and many as and one of the most important is uh, he was the one top 25 people in india awarded by the ndtv award and the retina hall of fame is established by the american society of retina specialists to honor many talented and dedicated individuals these physicians scientists and related healthcare workers who are many centuries and countless generations that devoted to their professional lives to innovation research and clinical care in the field of retina they have saved many from blindness and improved innumerable lives and i always salute him as a mata pita guru and mitra and deva and as retina hall of fame is established in 2016 they inducted 242 chartered inductees and uh, i'm happy to say that two from india in the charter members where it is uh, starting from 1851 to 2016 i'm glad uh, these are individuals with significant achievements in the retina hall of fame and uh, there are two indians in the chair charter i'm happy the teacher and the student are there and that's me and him we made a dedication in 2015 at the 75th birthday birth anniversary of uh, uh, birthday celebrations of dr naparma sami dr nakpal and dr badinar who are the main people for spreading retina here in the country and uh, this is a short video and uh, you can see dr badinar and dr golapalli rao are here and uh, so his message is not by penance not by visiting holy rivers not by reading scriptures not by chanting mantras but by only performing selfless service to humanity one can cross the ocean of life and he is a, a great supporter for all his students all the time so this is a book i rec- uh, recommend people to know it's a uh, concise mastery by richard green and when learning a new skill there comes a point of frustration where we quit on ourselves before we actually give up and dr badnath is a great uh, teacher and uh, learning and mastering a skill requires practice and therefore time as humans we tend to shrink away from anything that seems painful or overly difficult and i think all the painful moments when we were trained with dr badnath is a uh, i think is a pleasant journey i'm sure dr gopal uh, who's here who's a 
was an ardent student of Raghunath, will agree. And thanks to my three generations, Dr. my great grandfather was known to Dr. Venkat Swami and my father. And I, I take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Badinath, who, who could not be here, but I think uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here. And uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Arta. Arta. <clears throat> so, Dr. Tara Prasad, uh, we introduced by Dr. Uh, Chakraparti, Arup Chakraparti. No, yeah. uh, uh, no I, I, I take... Rajesh, I will introduce uh, Dr. Tara Prasad Das. Sir. Okay. Yeah. So, it's, it's, a, it, it's a matter of great honor for me and I'm really thankful to Dr. Pata Viswas to have uh, given the opportunity to introduce such a legendary figure like Dr. Tara Prasad Das, who is currently Vice Chairman of LV Prasad I Institute. He is also professor of ophthalmology at Sunyat Sen University, Gunjao, and at various other positions in various uh, hospitals like University of Rochester Medical School, etc. And there are various uh, other medical schools wherein he is working as an uh, honorary professor. He is a stalwart in vitreoretinal diseases and has published 309 papers in peer reviewed medical journals, index of 31, citation of 4112. It's it's huge. He has written 51 book chapters and has authored and edited 11 books. He has some current leadership positions at present, which includes the Vice President, Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, APAO, which is a matter of great uh, honor for all of us Indians. He is also the Chairman of uh, Universal Eye Health Program, Empowered Committee, Government of Odisha. He is also a member of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam International Foundation. And advisory board of various other organizations. And I would just like to be a little short because uh, otherwise we will not be able to hear Dr. Tipi Das. Uh, uh, we want to hear him more and more because he has delivered 21 eponymous lectures, has received many awards, which includes awards from American Academy, the Asia Pacific Academy, the APVRS, the ARVO, the IAPB, et cetera, and so many more. Dr. Das was conferred doctorate of science uh, Ravishaw University 211 and Government of India conferred the highest civilian award to him, Padma Shri, in the year 2013. And it's a matter of great honor and fortune for all of us to have Dr. Tipidas here and to uh, listen to him. So without uh, much ado, I will request Dr. Tipidas sir, to please take over. And we are Thank also you. proud he's the past president of All India Ophthalmic Society and contributed yeah. to our AOS. Huh? Congratulations, TP. Uh, thank you. Can I see my slides? Uh, yes. 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 You have to make it full screen. I'm doing it. Thanks, um, Rajesh, for uh, kind, generous words, and thanks uh, the AOS leadership to consider me to already the speaker for the prestigious uh, uh, Senge Madhu Srinivas Padrinath, uh, second uh, lecture of the AOS series. Uh, in 1980s, I was living in Madurai, working in Arvind Eye Hospital. And uh, between my two trains, uh, Madurai to Orissa, I had used to have eight hours of layoff time. And uh, I had a special arrangement with Shankar Nathralia, particularly with Professor Padrinath, that in between I will visit him. And uh, my way was that from one station, go and keep the luggage and uh, go straight to OR, Chandana Prime was to help me. First time when I went, I was given a, a, a printed paper, the OR etiquettes. And the first etiquette was wash your feet. And when I entered the OR with the change the OR clothes, uh, the first thing I noticed was they locked the door and I was told by Professor Patrina that you cannot leave before the surgery is over. That was in 1980s before the stellar paper of a Mark Speaker on use of betadine. The country India did not have a uh, power, uh, powderless uh, disposable gloves, so that was signs signs of how to how to prevent uh, infection in the eye, particularly endophthalmitis. He used to work very hard, and uh, one time I asked him. One of my business asked him, I was more courageous to ask him. Ask him that did you get tired doing the surgery? And he told, no, I never get tired. I only get exhausted. So I learned from him that uh, exhaust yourself to improve the world. So unlike um, other speakers, I will not speak about the, my philosophy. I will talk only pure science. I am fortunate, uh, Professor Badrinath. I am giving a lecture on your name. 
I will talk about understanding the signs of fungal anthomyitis. The uh, reason is that anthomyitis is not a very important subject from many point of view, but it happens. It happens very badly. And all of us are at one point or other, if a surgeon, we get certainly get affected by that. Fungi, as you all know, are, are, are uh, eukaryotic organisms, ubiquitous all over the world. We have got roughly 5 million bucks fungi all over the, all over the, all over, they grow everywhere but you do not get infected as much as you should. And why so? Why? Because I've got innate mechanism of the body that creates a lot of phagocytosis and pro-inflammatory cytokine to prevent these bugs. So that could be some of them, many of them are actually opportunistic or commensal. Some of them are could be pathogenic. So the body prevents a fungal infection in the, in the body in, and the eye. Anthomyitis is an inflammatory inflammation of the inner layer, particularly the vitreous, as is shown uh, by a borrowed slide from uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, that the vitreous uh, grows all those micro or ocular abscesses inside the eye. Pathologically, they are, uh, if you do a histopathology, normally in nuclear the eye in India, they only give the abyssal specimen. You can see a lot of uh, inflammations are highlighted here, and you can see in the GMS staining a uh, actual organism filamentous uh, fungi growing inside the inside the vitreous cavity. Uh, what happened? The slide is not moving now. Something happened. The slide is not moving. Hello. Okay, now it's moved. I will talk about three fungi only because they are the most common fungi in the in our in our country or in the world. They are Aspergillus and Fusarium. Both are filamentous molds, and the Candida, which is an yeast. And this shows uh, both uh, in the left side the, the culture and the right side microscopy how they look like. The why are they also important? Because we just submitted a paper about the analysis of 730 papers collected all over the country, from Delhi to to Madurai and from Pune to to Guwahati. It doesn't matter whether it's a post-op or trauma or endogenous, Aspergillus anthomatis is the most common fungi followed by Candida for endogenous and Fusarium for other species. So that is why it is confined to the three organisms. We also published several years ago that uh, in India, I reported up to 17% of fungal anthomatis compared to what published in EVS or ESCRS or even Singapore. Incidentally, China has also reported uh, closer to 13% of fungal anthomyitis. So it's very important for us, even though it happens less often than bacterial anthomyitis. Clinical diagnosis is very important that the telltale signs that you can diagnose clinically were, were that that, uh, that small amount of hypopium, but a lot of stomach, corneal edema, and, and, and vitreous exudation, or fungi adhering to the intraocular lens, fungi ball behind the pupil, or, or this kind of a inflammatory choroidal lesion sitting on the retina. Unfortunately, treatment options, available drugs are very few. They're mostly amphotericin B and voriconazole. When we system, you can have some other adjuvants though. Because they are less amount, less number of drugs available to us, very careful how do you diagnose and how do you treat. This is the classical picture, the classical slide that what you have got. And uh, only natomycin is available commercially, suppose you prepare topical, then topical amphotericin B or voriconazole has to prepare with a shorter shelf life. So in case of preparing some, be, be honest that you cannot keep longer than a certain period of time. Three pictures I'll show you. The preoperative, 64-year-old male, five months after carotid surgery, comes with a little hypopenia student first picture. After three surgery, intraoculans, explantation, and the three intravitreal injection, antifungal, systemic antibiotics, systemic antifungals, patient ultimately gains in three months' time to 2050-615. There's similarly a trauma, fungus ball behind the pupil required three surgery lensectomy, yes, but required 14 injections and systemic antibiotics to improve to 2060 by, by three months' time. And finally, the endogenous, where patient required also several injections, which means that one has to be, while diagnosing clinically, one to very patient about treating and inform the patient that require several, do the several treatment seasons to improve something. And even then, outcome is not as great. This paper, which is submitted also, so that depending on the post-op or trauma or, or endogenous anthomyitis, not more than 20% people at the end of huge number of surgeries and procedures will not get more than 2,200 or so. 
and 18% of them could be no light perception. And same thing true for, for, uh, for Aspergillus or Candida or, or Fusia. And this is one in 30 patients, so it's very large uh, real world data. Compare this with the, with the bacterial anosomiasis, and we published in 2005 that 20% of them had at least vision of 2040 and 60% have a vision of 2200. So compared to bacterial anosomiasis, fungal anosomiasis, uh, outcome are poorer despite a similar kind of treatment. So science, scientifically speaking, how do we change this? Because you have up to 17% fungal infection, you must know how to use the science for it. Science in the horizon, to my mind, are, are inflammatory markers, next generation sequencing, real world data, which can actually help improve the outcome of fungal anosomiasis. We published uh, last year, two, two years ago, that fungi also reside on, on, on the conjunctiva. This are not only does this some kind of genera like this uh, or viral like this, Escomycota, Deciduomycota, Zygomycota, but also the common fungi which actually infect the eye, like Aspergillus. Candida and Fusarium. So these guys are all opportunities sitting in the conjunctiva unless they're prepared to protect the eye properly, they can cause infection. And uh, we also have shown that in a cult so-called culture negative anthelmatis, when you do a, do a targeted uh, next generation sequencing and heat mapping, then a lot of Aspergillus or Candida actually grow even though culture is negative. This also, luckily, we have today pitadine iodine published in 1991 by Mark Speaker. That's that also killed the common fungi in not in less than 30 seconds. But unfortunately, when we do the survey of our Indian ophthalmologists, where over 4,000 ophthalmologists responded, unfortunately, in 2017, at least 14% of the ophthalmologists in India did not believe or did not use pitadine iodine as a preoperative preparation of the eye, and this would be told everybody it should be a kind of standard of care that is very important to prevent anosomiasis. We also saw that in 25 years of Prasad practice, culture negativity has increased from 50% in 1990s to 69 or 70% in 2015. What has actually happened? We being a referral center, patients who actually receive injections and come to the hospital. So that is why many times culture will not grow and sometimes fungi will not grow because it's difficult to grow. In, and we saw, we thought about uh, how the culture negative anosomiasis is working. We reported also, also two years ago that if you culture those uh, by the next generation sequencing or a true output uh, of uh, microbiology, micro microbiology, actually fungi, fungi grow even though they are culture negative. Look at the inflammatory markers. Fungi cell wall, the cartoon, has got two important things, uh, some kind of protein, nanoproteins, and some kind of glucans, so one, th three D beta glucans. These two can be used to produce, uh, to use inflammatory markers. And we just submitted the article that uh, by using the by using the GM as an inflammatory marker, the area on the curve is very high with high specificity and specificity. And same thing about, about beta glucan. So possibly these results are available in two to three hours time, and unlike a culture will take several weeks. World is going to change with the real world data and real world experience. Unfortunately, because of paucity of uh, patients of particularly fungal anthelmitis, and because that is very expensive to do a, do a, a randomized control trial, world will completely depend on the real world data and experience. And today with the introduction of electronic medical record system, which, which Professor Nachia spoke to a little bit to in the beginning, is going to the main thing. Now, how does it differ? Ideally, it's always an RCT. And what RCT does, RCT asks a question, randomized control trial, you ask a question and answer it. If, there, if a, a question can be answered by RCT, which will, I could be ideal by using the real world data on the, or the big data, one can think about alternately to answer through a target trial. Target trial is going to be the future of ophthalmic care uh, or replacing ultimately the randomized control trial. This I got from uh, Professor Lingam Gopal, and when I asked him that give me a quote, uh, which I would like to quote for uh, Professor Badrina, then I told this, uh, which uh, actually Nagra always speaks about this, do this for your patient, what to do for your own relative. It's very, very important, very, very important statement, because that is how one should always treat your patients. Globally, over 300 million people are affected with the serious fungal infection. Many of the invasive fungal infection like aspergillosis, candidiosis, fusarosis. 
25 million people at the estimation of 2018 by WHO at high risk of either dying or losing their sight. Unfortunately, fungi do not always grow in the culture. Histological differentiation identification challenging because they require a very high, high flown laboratory and, and an acute pathologist. In that situation, we have different opportunities. There is no global report on fungal anthomitis like a bacterial keratitis or, or bacterial anthomitis. There is no randomized control trial. There is no universal treatment protocol like EVS we have for vector anthomitis. This throws up opportunities to test new technology like molecular microbiology, targeted next engine sequencing, and real world data. And real world data going to be the real factor. While doing this, must be aware that because there are less number of, uh, of antifungal agents available to us today, and newer ones are not being made very quickly, will take several decades maybe, one must be very careful to avoid resistance and think about the antifungal stewardship, like we have got antimicrobial stewardship, because you can't afford to have resistant, resistant bugs to the few drugs that you have today. That is why, my friends, understanding the science, science of anthomatis, science of fungal anthomatis is, is very, very important. Um, Natarajan talked about the book release, it's a photograph where Professor Nakpal was there, and this is the real book of Insight by, by Sankar Nitralia. It talks about the compassionate care of Nitralia does, and then at the same time, those of us who are interested in learning a little more anthomitis than what you normally have, and I suggest that uh, the book edited with several, several people uh, called Anthomitis uh, Guide to Diagnosis Management. This could be one book which can be possibly help the young residents to understand more about anthomitis. Thank you very much. Over to you, Partha. Yes, sir. So thank you very much, uh, Deepida, sir. Pangal and ophthalmitis, and actually I wanted you to speak about the philosophy as well. But we know the philosophy. We have heard of you. We have heard of the institution. We have seen the institution. We have seen you. And thank you very much for being here with us today and your lecture, sir. We now go to the next lecture, and that is the SS Badrinath 2020 lecture by Dr. Lingam Upal, sir. Dr. Lingam Upal will be introduced by Dr. Santosh Unava, please. Good morning. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Lingam Gopal, who I've come to admire and draw inspiration from. Even as a resident, he used to be the faculty at Chankanetrale, and we used to admire him for what he was and what he, he was about to achieve. He has a basic medical education from Andhra Medical College, Vishakhapatnam, and post-graduation from PGI Chandigarh, and fellowship in VR surgery at Chankanetrale under the mentorship of uh, Dr. S. Padrinath. He went on to become a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. He gave his best of professional years to Shankaranitralia and currently he's a senior consultant at National University of Singapore. That's his second life. He's as curious as a child and you believe he got his MSc in biostatic things and epidemiology at the age of 60 from the London School of Epidemiology and Health. And he has the fastest turnover as a reviewer for IGO, which even shapes the younger uh, energetic reviewers. He has shaped the surgical uh, skills of majority of currently practicing VR surgeons in India, and that's a very uh, good credit. He is considered as a teacher of teachers and a true holder of Dr. S. Badrinath's legacy. His passion for ophthalmology and life are fueled by his wife, Vijaya, who is a renowned glaucoma expert in her own right. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Gopal and I invite him to deliver his lecture. Thank you, Santosh. Thank Happy you. congratulations, Gopal. Nice to see, because uh, right from time Gopal joined the Shankaratla, I was a volunteer, then uh, after that I became a fellow. And then you, where is Gopal? Yes, he's there in Singapore, sir, and he's joining from Singapore. Okay. Gopal, sir, 
welcome sir welcome home and happy welcome. congratulations gopal nice to see you all all the time looking good i only remember the white bearded uh, sir you muted eh? no no i am i am i am okay now so when, when we both became consultant patients were easily going to dr gopal because he had a white beard and nobody came to me thank you sir gopal you can uh, are you able to see my screen now yes sir yes 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 gopal i would like to uh, at the outset thank the all india honor society for having given me this most prestigious award named after my own mentor and philosopher guide and i i can't ask for anything better than this being asked to deliver the inaugural uh, award which is named after my own mentor and i would like to thank dr santosh manavar to for his kind introduction it's indeed a great honor to be able to deliver this inaugural ss badinath endowment oration and if i'm able to stand here today and deliver this oration is entirely due to this giant of a man who has been my teacher mentor philosopher and guide dr badinath can probably be described by any of these epithets and many more that have been listed in this slide it's obvious that he assumed different roles in his life all with perfection but what impacted the ophthalmic community at large is the fact that he lit the lamp of knowledge in many minds and most of us gathered here would have benefited from him either directly or indirectly not just about ophthalmology and vr surgery but perhaps about everything in life if i were to summarize his philosophy in the context of ophthalmology in one slide it would be something that is listed in the slide i'm not going to go into the details but only stress on two points which are probably very apt that is the last two points practice what you preach and success is mostly due to hard work and not because of inspiration alone the topic i was asked to speak on is science of ophthalmology and my philosophy the last thing i would like to do is to bore you with my philosophy instead i would refer you to the previous slide the commandments of dr badinath and these i am sure will stand you in very good stead well i can stop at this but since i have been asked to deliver this oration i thought of sharing with you how these commandments have helped me in my life specifically as an ophthalmologist and vitreo retinal surgeon and a little bit of dabbling in research they have indeed changed my life from a bumbling mediocre man i started off with i can confidently say that at the age of 65 i have been able to contribute to society however small thanks to dr badinath coming to the science of ophthalmology the areas that i had the opportunity to work are these three in the main fundus colobomas retinopathy of prematurity and vitreous substitutes it goes without saying that is always a team effort and i was fortunate to be a part of the team which worked on these three areas so whatever contributions i am listing out are not necessarily my own self but on behalf of an entire team which worked for these contributions about fundus coloboma we have published a few uh, regarding the various aspects of coloboma just to as uh, specify a few points a salient point which have not been stressed upon in the previous literature that fundus coloboma we have defined the optic disc involvement in the coloboma in a, a very important publication in ophthalmology we have also described how to identify the intracalary membrane breaks and demonstrated how to identify the site of communication between the sub intracalary membrane space and sub retinal space which are important in the management of coloboma related retinal detachments we have also described on the preferred technique of management of management of retinal detachments related to coloboma of the choroid in two publications set about 7 uh, years apart wherein we could gain more experience and found that a lot of techniques could be uh, improved upon over a period of the last 7 years coming to retinopathy of prematurity i have had interest in this Uh, disease right from the day I joined Shankaratnalaya, because of the fact that I have seen a few patients of stage five retinopathy of prematurity who, for whom we have refused all treatment, saying they are blind and nothing can be done. And our initial studies have been first to identify 
that ROP indeed exists in India and is a major problem. Like uh, ostriches, we have been denying the existence of ROP till that time. And once we demonstrated in publications from our center as well as Dr. Dogra center in PGI and one from uh, Bangalore, that ROP indeed exists in India, it has become now an epidemic situation. Our initial experience with lasers has also been shared in publications. But what I would like to point your attention to is one particular publication, which was actually spearheaded by my colleague, Dr. Parveen Sen, wherein she demonstrated that the laser to the ridge is still quite safe because we know traditionally, if when the Japanese started laser for ROP, they were treating the ridge and not the avascular retina. But it's only subsequently people realize that you don't have to treat the ridge, you treat only the avascular retina. But there are a few cases which don't respond despite having had good ablation of the avascular retina. And in these cases, we found that treating the ridge has an improvement in these select cases and it's quite safe. We also evolved a technique for the uh, trying to reattach the retina in these detached retinas secondary to retinopathy of prematurity. We evolved a technique of stage five ROP and we married the advantages of periphery to center dissection and center to periphery dissection to facilitate an entire removal of the fibrovascular tissue that is keeping the retina attached. We shifted from sacrificing the iris, which was what was recommended initially because that gives you access to the periphery instantaneously, especially superiorly, to trying to retain the iris, but having it enlarged people by using the iris hooks and thus giving us a good facility and access to the entire tissue in the periphery. The third area of interest I had was the hunt for vitreous substitutes. And here I was very fortunate that when I shifted to Singapore, I could collaborate with uh, two important people who remain even now my important collaborators for research. One is Professor Sue Zinni, who is an ophthalmologist and a PhD from Cambridge. And another is Dr. Lo Sijon, who is a polymer scientist and a professor of uh, polymer science in A star labs in Singapore. So bringing us together and this entire team was the main uh, contribution in addition to the laboratory science of Professor Suzini. And to see our collaborative effort, we had two major back-to-back -back grants which could facilitate some amount of uh, scientific research in this field. Our first publication was in Nature Bio Biomaterials it's a retinal detachment repair and vitreous like body reformation via a thermogelling polymer endo tamponade. This is a tri block polymer, and all these three polyethylene glycol, polypropylene glycol, and polycaprolactone, caprolactone are approved FDA materials that could be used biologically. So none of these need approvals, but it is a tri block polymer itself, which would of course need an approval. It is thermosensitive. It is liquid at lower temperature and becomes a gel at the body temperature. Hence, it's easy to inject if it is already kept in the refrigerator because it's liquid. And once you inject, it forms a gel and has the tamponading effect on the retina. It's optically clear with a refractive index of 1.3. You can actually treat the retina through this. You can use laser, cryo, whatever you want, and has a good view of the fundus. So you can picture, photograph the retina as well as do OCT postoperatively. It's biodegradable, so it doesn't require removal. It maintains structural integrity and is tailored to ophthalmic needs in view of its uh, transparency and optical clarity. So our initial trials in rabbit and monkey eyes have been fairly successful, which resulted in the publication. And this is the uh, picture from the rabbit eyes, which shows the top row is non-operated eyes, middle row is operated controls, means no vitrectomy alone was done, no gel was injected, it was only saline. And the last one was where we injected our gel. And it shows that the integrity of the retina is well maintained. And the OCT shows uh, the, the, the integrity of the uh, ellipsoid zone and external limiting membrane, which is indirectly indicative of the photoreceptor function. We also have good results in the monkey eyes, the NHP eyes, wherein we actually detach the retina first after creating a retinotomy and reattach it by fluid air exchange, endolaser, and filling it with endotamponade using the uh, gel that we have used. And we found that the macular function is well maintained both on OCT evaluation and on ERG and PERG evaluations. So all in all, 
the studies with the basic material that we have evolved have been fairly successful. We are now in the next stage of trying to tweak the product for commercialization because we know that between the laboratory grade and the medical grade, there's a lot of difference. And all these have to be including sterilization process, et cetera. And that is taking time. And that's where we are right now. We are hoping that in the next uh, one year or two, we should be able to come out with a usable product that could potentially replace the usage of silicon oil. The other area where I was able to, to work with Professor Suzini, whose interest is in on RPE and neural cell transplant, is trying to help her in trying to implant these grown RPE cells on a scaffold into the subretinal space. So this experience in the monkey eyes and rabbit eyes could well be useful for me if one day we are able to actually grow RPE cells and, and implant subretinally in human beings as a routine. So these are a few of my uh, contributions to science to see the training uh, that I have received from Dr. Bhadinath. So in, conclu in conclusion, I would like to state that ophthalmology is as much an inexact science as biology, as all other biological sciences, unlike phys physics. And hence it needs tremendous amount of observational skills and ability to sort of weigh the evidence far and again before you come to any conclusions, because it's the inexact science. And the life of Dr. Bhadinath has given us several guiding principles for a very safe, effective, and quality practice of ophthalmology, as well as for developing innovative approaches. Research of any good quality needs good, sustained, and focused collaborative effort. And these are things which you learn from great people like Dr. Badanad, Dr. Golapali Rao, Dr. Namparaman Swami, and others. Thank you very much for your attention. And just before we leave, I just want to share with you a few photographs of my mentor, Dr. Badanad. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, yes. uh, thank, thank you, you so much. Dr. Bishwas uh, uh, has gone to another session. So thank you very much. And uh, I would like to so I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gulapali Rao, Dr. Nampar Pal Sami, Dr. Maipal Sajdev, yes. Lalit Verma, Namrata Sharma, Rajesh Shinha, uh, Santosh Shanawar, and uh, uh, also the uh, moderator was Dr. Partha Bishwas. We had a uh, Endowment lecture by Dr. Nachia, Dr. B.K. Jain, Dr. Surendran, Dr. Professor Mangal Chogra, Dr. Tara Prasad Das, and Gopal Lingam. And thanks to all of you. I think uh, Dr. Gulapali has said uh, that his, uh, uh, introducing was a waste of time. I don't agree. And I wanted to say he only mentioned that uh, people don't remember. And I think uh, Isaac Newton and Charles Char Charter mentioned only when you know people who have contributed, like Dr. Rao, Dr. Bajna, Dr. Nam, Dr. Venkat Sami. We can stand on their shoulder and see further. And that's what we are all doing. And I think I learned a, a great. And since we are already exceeded the session, I thank each and every one and the uh, Indian way of Namaste. And we are dedicated uh, this to all our uh, teachers who are there and who are uh, up there and blessing us. And I hope this is an inspiration for all the youngsters who are going to see and hope to see in the future. Thank you very much. And Amit, uh, from Scientific Committee, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, I'm telling sir, yeah. Uh, I think we are running sh short of time. Just Namaskaram to all the stalwarts to whom we have given the AIS Endowment Awards. Namaskaram and thank you. No words to say.